So today we're going to talk about astrocytic glutamate uptake in the central nervous system. Glutamate has a variety of functions. For now, we are only going to focus on the role of glutamate in synaptic transmission. In the central nervous system, it is the most prominent excitatory neurotransmitter. Here is a picture of a typical synapse as it is usually presented in most textbooks. A more accurate representation would look a little more like this. The cells surrounding the synapse are called astrocytes. In fact, glia, the class of cells that astrocytes belong to, comprise over 80% of the cells in your central nervous system. Compare that to neurons, which only make about 15% of the cells. As it turns out, without glia, meaningful synaptic transmission would not be possible. Astrocytes take up glutamate using various types of excitatory amino acid transporters, which localize near areas of synaptic transmission and are shown here in blue and abbreviated EAAT. They do this for a variety of reasons. One of the most important reasons is to ensure a high signal-to-noise ratio during synaptic transmission. They achieve this by removing glutamate from the synaptic cleft and terminating the excitatory signal. They also maintain the low synaptic extracellular glutamate concentration by preventing glutamate from other parts of the brain from entering the synapse, since these concentrations are often a thousand times greater than that of the synapse. They also prevent neurotransmitter from leaking out of the synapse and spilling out to neighboring synapses, which would decrease the overall signal-to-noise ratio. Glutamate uptake deficiency caused by a decreased or reversed activity of the transporters, a decrease in expression, or by a decrease in the transporter's ability to localize near synapses, has been associated with a number of neurodegenerative diseases including ALS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Huntington's disease, and epilepsy. Let's take a look at how astrocytes perform this important task of uptaking glutamate. Glutamate uptake is very highly dependent on ion gradients. Glutamate transporters couple the uptake of glutamate with the movement of three sodium ions down their electrochemical gradient. The free energy change for sodium ion uptake is negative and can be coupled to glutamate transport. In the short term, glutamate transport leads to a local increase in intracellular sodium concentrations. Also, during glutamate uptake, the transporter recruits the sodium calcium exchanger and forms a complex with the sodium potassium ATPase as well as mitochondrial and glycolytic enzymes. The local buildup of sodium causes the sodium calcium exchanger to operate in the reverse direction, exchanging one sodium ion for one calcium ion. The influx of calcium decreases the mitochondrial mobility, exchange, causing the mitochondria to park near the transporter. The availability of mitochondria allows for an increase in ATP levels, which then allows the sodium potassium pump to become phosphorylated and transport three sodium ions against their concentration gradients to maintain the gradient highly necessary for glutamate uptake. The transporter is then returned to its high affinity state by the transport of one potassium ion down its concentration gradient and the cycle is complete. It is obvious that glutamate transport is a very energetically demanding process. Collapse of the sodium gradient will stop glutamate uptake and in some cases will cause the transporter to operate in the reverse direction, releasing glutamate into the synaptic space. This has deleterious effects on neurons and can lead to excitotoxicity of glutamate, a condition often associated with the neurodegenerative diseases described earlier. Let's explore how astrocytes are able to prevent this by meeting the high energy demands of glutamate uptake. Classically, it is thought that once taken up by the astrocytes, glutamate is converted to glutamine. However, studies have shown that a significant amount of glutamate is converted to alpha-ketoglutarate either by the cytosolic transaminase reaction or via oxidation by the mitochondrial enzyme glutamate dehydrogenase. Studies have shown that pharmacologically inhibiting either GDH or the sodium potassium ATPase will block glutamate uptake and lower its Vmax, which makes sense given the non-competitive effects of the inhibitors. Inhibiting the synthesis of glutamine does not block sodium-dependent glutamate uptake. Little data exists to show that blocking the transaminase reaction also blocks glutamate uptake. So what does this mean? Well, recall that glutamate is converted to alpha-ketoglutarate, which is a TCA cycle intermediate. That means that glutamate can be preferentially used as an energy substrate over glucose. Increasing glutamate levels or decreasing glucose levels will increase the oxidation of glutamate into TCA cycle intermediates. Conversely, reversing these effects decreases glutamate oxidation. With these results, we are presented with a remarkable observation. The most prominent excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system ensures its meaningful signal and neuroprotective effects by fueling and thus regulating its own uptake. 